Death Speaks Written by Tessa Kay Narrated by Tony Gazzawi There wasn't a care in the world in the minds of the people of Hagewood. The festival was underway, a beautiful whirlwind of dancing, eating, and games. The lights in the town square had been dimmed to allow for the showing off of dragons flying overhead, blowing great streaks of fire through the sky, as though they wanted to celebrate too. Laughter carried almost louder than the music, and no one expected to have to call the coroner. In fact, when members of the crowd first noticed Arius, strewn across the cobbled street, they thought he'd simply passed out drunk. They had let him stay where he was for hours into the night, some even stepping across him to reach their desired location. It wasn't until people were beginning to go home that a vendor, wanting him gone, threw water in his face to jostle him, only to realize that Arius was not sleeping, but really actually quite dead. And so, the coroner was called. It was not immediately apparent what had happened to cause Arius's death. He had no visible wounds, and seemed young enough and perfectly healthy. Not wanting to leave any possibilities unexplored, a few roundsmen came out to search the area and question the festival-goers. At the coroner's office, Arius lay on a cold metal table. He had been stripped naked and now lay under a sheet, waiting to be poked and prodded, so the cause of his ultimate demise might be discovered. The coroner approached. I was on my way home. The coroner jumped away from the table, his heart feeling like it didn't beat at all, the rushing of blood overtaking his ears. The corpse had not talked. He had seen a lot of things in his time, all manners of curses placed on the dead bodies of unsuspecting victims, but the corpse had not talked. It was very late. That was all. Swallowing hard, the coroner stepped up to the table again. Arius lay completely still. His eyes closed serenely, not a hint of life in his features. He had not talked. And yet, he did again. I wasn't even supposed to be out tonight. The coroner tried to turn toward the door, but found he couldn't. He was frozen in place, but not out of fear, although he had plenty. He would have run out of the room as quickly as his feet would carry him, but it was like there were chains all around him, anchoring him to the floor. What do you want? The coroner's voice quaked. Arius didn't answer the question, only continued his previous thought. I got a promotion at work today. Going to the festival, that was my way of celebrating. Please, the coroner stuttered. I just want to leave peacefully. If Arius heard the plea, he gave no sign of it. I was going home. I didn't want to stay out too late. I even told my friends goodbye already. Guess that's why no one knew for so long. The coroner barely heard Arius over the sound of his own heart beating rapidly in his chest. But he realized he was talking about that night. How his body had lain on the street for so long and no one had noticed. His voice sounded so sad. She said she needed help. Through his fear, the coroner couldn't help but feel a tinge of curiosity. She? And I followed her, said Arius. I was so stupid. I didn't even ask her what she needed help with. What was her name? Now the coroner was thinking more clearly. His heart still beat quicker than its normal pace, but he knew that this was an opportunity. Arius could tell him everything he needed to know. Justice could be found quickly. She took me to a house, Arius continued. We went into the garage. I'm not even sure if it was hers. There was already so much blood when we went in. I froze when I saw it, or maybe she froze me? I'm not sure which one it was initially, but I know she froze me during that moment because when I realized what I was seeing and tried to turn around, I couldn't. A cold swept over the corner as he realized that he was in a very similar predicament. She walked behind me so that I couldn't see her. I remember my heart beating so fast I thought it was going to explode. And then everything around me rolled over. I thought I'd fallen until I realized I could see the rest of my body still standing there. It was only my head on the floor. She must have done it with magic. It was so smooth. No hacking. I didn't see any weapons in her hands, but it burned like she'd done it with fire. A look flashed through Arius' eyes a display of emotion that had not been present on his features before. He looked like he could still feel the burning. I still don't understand how it is that I could see her after, see my own body from where my head was on the floor. Whatever she'd done to cause this, his voice broke. Whatever this is, I've never heard of anyone doing it. The coroner hadn't either. Whatever enchantment had been placed upon Arius to keep him seeing and talking and knowing was not one the coroner had ever seen. And being in the profession he was, he'd have thought if such a thing existed, he'd know. She put my head upon a shelf, Arius continued, so I could watch everything she did to me. 
Even though I could see, I couldn't control anything. I couldn't turn my head or any parts of my unattached body. I couldn't even close my eyes. She put the rest of me on a table, kind of like this one. The coroner eyed the metal slab of a table on which Arius' body laid. Unsure of what sensations Arius still had, he felt somewhat bad now for how cold the table must have been. She cut me open first. Just took a big old hook-looking thing and dug it through my stomach. She gutted me. She took out everything, all the slimy little parts that had been what made me tick before. Then she patched me back up, empty. Luckily, I didn't feel it. I guess that was one small mercy she gave me. Next, she cut off all of my limbs. I had no idea why, until she disappeared through a door into what I assume was the rest of the house. When she came back, she had three big black bags, and she took out of them more parts. Arms and legs and torsos and even a couple more heads. I don't know if they could see me like I could see them. They looked dead, but then so did I. She moved most of me off the table. She left my right leg. She took away my stomach, which made me wonder why she'd cleaned it out to begin with. She replaced the things she took with others. Look under the sheet. It took the coroner several seconds to realize that Arias had addressed him directly. He had been lost in the story, listening in horror. When his brain had caught up to Arias' words, he tested the weight of them. He could move again, but only forward. He tried, but the coroner found he had only regained a very limited control of himself. He could only raise his hands towards the sheet covering Arius' body. He lifted it, and nearly fainted. Whatever enchantment had been placed over Arius' body before, which had led the coroner and the officers of the festival to believe Arius had no external wounds, had dissipated. It was not even a matter of Arius having internal or external wounds at all, because most of the body on the table did not belong to Arius. Long crisscrosses of jagged red thread snaked around Arius's neck and over the places where each limb normally would have been joined to Arius's torso. Before, Arius's body had been soft flesh, most likely human, but changeling at most. His head was still, but the torso on the table now glistened with scales. Fur covered the left leg, hip to toe, and both arms were skinny and slimy, a pale shade of blue that ended in webbed fingers. Bile rose in the coroner's mouth, but he swallowed it down as Arius spoke again. I'm still helping her. I don't want to, but I am. I think she wants your help, too. All around the corner, the world rolled. He really had fainted, he thought, but in his neck he felt the worst kind of burning sensation, and for some reason he could still see himself, standing, locked into place beside the table. Only now there was someone standing with him.